Our first reading this morning comes from the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. One resource described Ezekiel this way, the book of Ezekiel contains the prophecies, visions, and symbolic actions of Ezekiel, an exilic prophet who lived among the exiles in Babylon. This prophetic book is filled with deeply symbolic visions and extreme actions from a man of zealous faith and profound spiritual vision. Chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me round among them, and behold, there were very many upon the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said to me, Prophecy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And as I looked, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophecy to the breath, prophecy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great host. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost, we are clean cut off. Therefore prophecy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you home to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. And you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, says the Lord. Our second reading is found in the New Testament. Matthew, chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, give your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to the one who asks of you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, 
so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me, please? God of peace, God of hard lessons, and God of abundant grace. We ask for openness of heart. We pray for willingness of spirit. We pray for the courage to receive your word and to act on it. In the name of Christ, amen. The prophet Ezekiel lived in the 500s BCE, which happened to be a pretty bleak time in his nation's history. Judah had been conquered by the Babylonian Empire. Jerusalem was in ruins. All of the religious and political leaders and the educated and artistic folks were living in exile after the invasion and the takeover. In today's scripture reading, Ezekiel has a vision in which he's traipsing through some wreckage, a valley of dry bones. Ezekiel's vision is of a wasteland that tells a tragic story of dreams that were dashed, attempts at reconciliation that were abandoned, life that is no more. If you want to get a feel for what Ezekiel was maybe walking through in his vision, how desolate and tragic and specific it was, I'm picturing what God might show us in a vision of our own nation. Maybe in this vision, we're walking along the desert in Arizona, not far from the Mexican border, and we see a valley of shoes and backpacks and empty water bottles left by migrants desperate for a chance at survival. Or maybe in the vision, God would walk with us among smoldering ashes, the bones of what used to be forest, or parks, or towns, consumed by wildfires made uncontrollable by climate change. Or maybe the vision would be of memorials to gun violence victims, God would walk us through hundreds of makeshift markers outside schools, next to playgrounds, outside of movie theaters and synagogues and mosques and churches. Ezekiel in his vision is led to the aftermath of violence, a stark reminder of his country's circumstances. I was trying to come up with a second scripture reading for a sermon about peace in our nation, and I found myself stuck here all week with Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones. And I realized that that's what it feels like. Like the possibility for peace in this country is as distant as the possibility of long dead bones coming to life again. Mortal, can these bones live? Oh God, Ezekiel says, you know. I certainly don't. I don't know if peace, if vibrant life is possible. Honestly, it seems like we are heading in the wrong direction, descending further into violence, dead set at our own rightness, fearful of difference, mired in threats and mistrust and straight up hatred. Mortal, can these bones live? Oh God, you know. 
We're in our third of four weeks with the Sermon on the Mount, approaching Jesus' famous words in Matthew as a map to peace, instructions for living a life, to borrow words from Mary Oliver. Jesus' teachings in these chapters are challenging because they're so specific and so applicable to our very lives. It's not like he's talking about kings or fishermen or fig trees, making it easy for us to like wriggle out of having to do exactly what he says. These words in Matthew seem quite clear and addressed to human beings really across time and space. Hear his teachings again, this time in the Eugene Peterson paraphrase, The Message. You're familiar with the old written law, love your friend, and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer. For then you're working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. God gives their best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish to everyone, regardless, the good and the bad, the nice and the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is grow up. Your kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. Peace in our nation is a daunting topic to preach on, especially now. It's telling that the only scripture I could think of to pair with the Sermon on the Mount this week was the Valley of the Dry Bones. But if we're going to get there, Jesus' words are how we're going to do it. Here's another old saying that deserves a second look, he says, message paraphrase again. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, is that going to get us anywhere? Here's what I propose, don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues for the shirt off your back, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice servant life. No more tit-for-tat stuff. Live generously. Jesus says, stop trying to win and start trying to love. Make that your objective, your honest goal, to love people. Are we doing that in our daily lives? Not just with the people who are easy to love, but the harder ones, making it our goal to love them? Because in order to love people, we have to listen to them. And we have to trust that something they are saying will make sense if we listen long enough. No matter who they are, if we listen long enough, something that they're saying will make sense. So much of peacemaking happens on an interpersonal level. If you just love the people who think like you and agree with you and you live in an echo chamber that affirms your worldview, Jesus says, well, anybody can do that. Peace in our country will not come from our yard signs or our clever sayings on bumper stickers. It will not come from trash talk or name calling or tweets. And I love a witty zinger as much as the next person. But all of these things, the signs and the slogans and the t-shirts and the memes we pass around, they are fun, sometimes cathartic ways to identify which team we're on and solidify our animosity toward the other team. They are not pathways to peace. When we don our team gear, 
yell obscenities at the television, scroll our social media feed for confirmation that our friends don't like the same people we don't like. We're just dressing up the skeletons in Ezekiel's boneyard, putting costumes on them, pretending that we're making meaningful progress toward peace. Love your enemies, Jesus says. Pray for them. Give to them. Humanize them. He modeled this consistently. He had heart-to-heart conversations with people who wanted to kill him. He crossed the tracks again and again to have meals and sit at the sick beds and listen to the ones that mainstream society had normalized despising. Love your enemies, Jesus says, the people who are easy to make a caricature of or a stereotype, who are to us just some nameless bones outside of our immediate sphere. Come a little closer. Jesus says, until you can see them breathe, until you can see them as a three-dimensional whole person. God says to Ezekiel in his vision in the valley, prophesy to the breath. Call on the spirit to breathe life into these bones so you can see that they are human. Watch the bones connect to each other and form a person, and then watch the breath come and cause the person's rib cage to expand and contract and expand and contract until you can testify that once you, what you once saw as just a pile of bones is a person. I don't have a whole elaborate plan for peace in our country. Shocking, I know. I don't have the secret answer. But I think that allowing our enemies to become human in our eyes, like us here in this room practicing that, is somewhere to start. There was a Washington Post piece this week by the Haitian-American author Edwidge Danticat in response to the vilification of Haitian immigrants in this country for decades, really, but as we've seen, has been ramped up in the last several weeks. Dantika writes, in moments like this, I often find myself, at least initially, at a loss for words. How should I best proclaim our humanity? This has been almost word for word what I have read in pleas by Haitian Americans in every article these last brutal weeks. Consistently, how do we prove that we are human? There's a store owner quoted in the New York Times, when a politician talks about Haitians, he's talking about real people. He's talking about family. He's talking about humans. How do I best proclaim our humanity. In the midst of all of that, this week I did a little internet search for the United Methodist Churches in Springfield, Ohio, where the national focus has been on account of these despicable rumors where neighbors in a group chat were encouraging fellow residents to pick up their guns. So I took a look at the UMCs of Springfield, just seeing what they're doing, these churches. I was doing that thing I do, we do, with the news looking to suss out the United Methodist Churches, see if they were on the right team or not, seeing if they were doing things that I agreed with or if I could self-righteously judge them. Not proud, just saying that I'm just as much in need of saving as the next person. So anyway, I found High Street United Methodist Church in Springfield, Ohio, and I listened to their pastor's sermon from September 8th, not having any idea what to expect. The sermon was about growing edges and edges in general, the margins. And this pastor, to a mostly or all white congregation from what I could tell, she said, we all have our growing edges. She said, I am a work in progress. She told a story of her impatience with people ahead of her at the ATM. 
people for whom English was not a first language, taking a long time at the machine and how this irritated her. But then the pastor said she visited an English class for recent Haitian migrants, whom she consistently referred to throughout the sermon as our new neighbors. And she said in visiting this class, she realized how hard just a basic thing like using an ATM can be when a society does not operate in a language that you understand. And in visiting this class, the nameless, faceless people known as immigrants, or in some hateful rhetoric as illegal aliens, or simply those people, became to this pastor neighbors. People to be listened to and treated gently and showered with compassion. Humans. And this was, on the surface, a very simple story for this pastor to tell her Springfield, Ohio congregation. She offered her story, her perspective, to them, whatever their politics. I'm a work in progress, she reminded them. We are all works in progress. But this very simple story, this witness, in it I felt the Holy Spirit dare everyone listening to see people differently. I felt the Holy Spirit asking listeners to allow folks who had just been stereotypes and numbers and people taking up space at the ATM to take on skin and personalities and beating hearts and inhales and exhales. To see their new neighbors for who they are, human. And if those members of the high street congregation are open to that invitation from the Spirit, if they become witnesses themselves to other people in their town, family members in other places, friends on social media, witnesses to the humanity of someone who has been dehumanized, whole groups of people, well, then that sounds like small steps on the way to peace. And it's easy to point at that place in Springfield that's been all over the news and be like, yeah, they definitely have work to do over there to get better at loving people, et cetera, et cetera. But last I checked, there is a list of categories of people that I don't really think of as human all that often. I see their yard signs. I see their baseball caps. I see their bumper stickers. And I write them off before I've even met them. And if they're taking too long at the ATM or they cut me off in traffic or whatever else they could do to annoy me, you bet I'm going to connect their rude behavior to the other things I already know I don't like about them. And they will stay a lifeless pile of bones in my mind, and the possibility for peace in this land will stay just as lifeless and inert. And so what will it take for me to have a conversation where I actually listen, or an experience like Ezekiel where I see what I thought were just bones come to life before me, where I could get up and preach right here and call somebody we've been primed to dislike our new neighbors. Who is asking, begging to be seen as a human being? And what is my role in that? What is the role of our church? Peace doesn't come from loving the people who are easy to love or from giving people the consequences we think they deserve, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Peace, Jesus says, comes from generous living, generous application of the word family, sibling, neighbor, friend. He says peace comes from generous living, from giving far more than is asked, like we talked about last week, generously interpreting what someone says or does as much as we possibly can, allowing our hearts to soften and our minds to change from time to time. Can these bones live? Can we start to perceive our enemies, the people who are hardest to love, as people? 
Can we listen with some openness? Can we volunteer ourselves as witnesses in some small way in just our regular little lives? Witnesses to what is possible. Amen. Thank you for being a participant enthusiastically in worship today, for meeting new folks, and I invite you to continue the conversation in fellowship hour over some coffee and snacks. And now as we go out, we go out as peacemakers who are blessed and commissioned and given all that we need with the command to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us, to live generously and to know that we ourselves are chosen and given and served and sent out to the world. So we go out in great peace. Amen. NBUMC Weekly is a production of North Bethesda United Methodist Church located in Bethesda, Maryland. Follow us on YouTube and Facebook at North Bethesda UMC or on Instagram at Loving All Neighbors. All music is licensed via Christian Copyright Licensing International, CCLI. <laughs>